Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome to another hour of provocative inquiry designed to inform and enlighten all of us about ourselves and the world around us. The next hour is dedicated to understanding what it means to be human, what forces act upon us and why, what we can expect of ourselves and others, what is meant by free will or the limitation thereof, and why any and all of this might even really matter, all in our effort to grasp exactly what enlightenment means and what it is to be enlightened. We make it a point to admit in the beginning that there are many human limitations, some we know and some we might not be aware of, and therefore we acknowledge that everything we have thought we knew just might be wrong. In this week, in this way, each week we undertake anew our search and discovery of the human potential in hopes that we truly expand our awareness. Last week, our guest was Dr. John L. Turner, and he left us with a story about a young man, Daryl, that chose not to be an organ donor as a result of some of his own dreams. Had it not been for this prompting and the subsequent refusal by his family to allow his organs to be donated, the boy probably would have been cut up alive and without anesthetic, since it he had been determined to be technically brain dead. Dr. Turner learned from the family that Daryl was signaling them by gripping his mother's hand. This, of course, indicated a level of consciousness. Dr. Turner tested Daryl himself and discovered that the boy was not only conscious, but that he could signal the family that he loved. And he did this using their traditional method with his fingers. This was a truly heartwarming story, and many in our chat room talked about the goosebumps that the story gave them. However, there was a question from the chat room that we did not get to. That question is one that turned up in your email as well. In the hurry that medicine sometimes goes to, in order to preserve the integrity of organs that are being donated, how many donors are actually conscious when this occurs? Recently, a new study showed that even the so-called vegetative and minimally conscious can learn. A classical conditioning method was used to test cognitive awareness. The researchers paired a tone with a soft blast of air to the eye. As with Pavlo's dogs that learned to salivate at the sound of a bell, because food had been paired with that sound, the patients in the study learned to flinch their eyelids. Other studies have found that coma patients are misdiagnosed as much as 40% of the time. According to the Mohonk uh, report, a report to Congress on the disorders of consciousness, assessment, treatment, and research needs. According to neurophilosophy blogger online, quote, it was also long assumed that patients who have existed in such conditions, comatose, for long periods cannot recover. However, it is now clear that is not always the case. In 2007, researchers used an experimental surgical procedure called deep brain stimulation to improve brain function in a patient who had been in a minimally conscious state for more than six years. Almost immediately, this patient opened his eyes and responded to voices. In the following months, he became capable of speaking, swallowing, and raising a cup to his mouth. Then there is the remarkable case of Terry Wallace, who went into a vegetative state following an accident in 1984, only to emerge from it 19 years later despite doctors' insistence that he would never recover. Now, harken back to the Terry Schiavo case and the controversy around that. Science moves on and we learn more every day, and there remains no shortage of moral dilemmas for our society to wrestle with. Well, in some future show, we may take this all on in detail. Until then, think carefully about your views on this issue. I know one of our upcoming guests that will insist that our individual consciousness extends to every cell of the being, and that obviously that, therefore, would include our organs. Is this fiction imitating life, or is this life imitating fiction? I'll leave that to you. Now to your letters. 
And I'm, I apologize, but there just is not time to read all of your letters on the air. But I do want you to know that I do read them all personally, and I am sincerely grateful for your feedback. Okay, if you remember, two weeks ago, Neil Donald Walsh and I disagreed about virtue. His view took the path of cultural relativity, and mine wanted to insist that certain values are not merely decided upon by popular majority. Well, Diana wrote, Loved that broadcast. I particularly enjoyed what you had to say about your interview with Neil. You rock, Elton. Well, thanks, Diana. And Rosie wrote, Thank you so much for your interesting programs on Hay House Radio. I listen to you from Jerusalem, Israel. We get them from around the world, and that just thrills me. And in Bangor, uh, Banger, Maine wrote, I'm excited to learn about Dr. Taylor's work. I'm enjoying the Hay House radio broadcast. I find myself smiling at Dr. Taylor's cut to the core insight and not so common common sense. The guest line up has been unusual and thought provoking. And Lisa from Australia wrote, Hi, Eldon. I wanted to tell you that I'm absolutely loving your radio shows every week. You have fantastic guests. What you have to say is absolutely brilliant. Many, many thanks for your work. Well, and again, thank you, Lisa. Pat wrote about last week's show. Just heard your show with Dr. John Turner and very much agree that forgiveness is essential for well-being and healing. Thank you. Nora wrote, I heard on Eldon's show, Provocative Enlightenment, that there is a free MP3 download on forgiveness. But when I click on the link, I only see the free CD offer. Can you please provide me with a correct link for the MP3? Now, we have many letters and calls about this one, and I apologize. For the free MP3, go to www.innertalk.com. Use the left-hand navigation pane under free MP3s to select the forgiving program. While you're there, take a look at uh, all the other programs uh, that we make available to you without charge of any kind. They range from stress to feelings of hopelessness, and I've put them there to aid you in helping yourself. These are not samples. They are the real deal. This is the patented and scientifically proven effective intertalk technology. It's just part of my way of paying it forward, you might say. Okay, and finally, Bridget wrote regarding the free MP3 programs. Thank you so much for your generosity and your great work on Hay House Radio. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for letters this week, but please keep them coming. I do appreciate your feedback. Be sure you let Hay House know that you enjoy this radio show if you do. You can email me by going to eldentaylor.com and submitting your comments from anywhere in the world. Uh, that's eldentaylor.com. Now, to this week's show. Are you being programmed? Are you the sum total of the information you have consumed in your life? Did you consume the, quote, right, end quote, information? Are your beliefs really genuinely yours or just those you have chosen to agree with due to mind persuasion influences? As humans in our society today, are we just carrying out the orders of those that have given us the choices we make? I mean, the kind of vehicle you want. The type of clothes that you buy, the notions you have about how you would like to live, the manner in which you carry yourself, and so much more. Are these all the product of Madison Avenue merchandising? What about your mood states? Are they modulated to some extent by those who seek to influence your decisions? Are you aware of the many technologies that have been devised to control your attitudes, your moods, your thoughts, even your ambitions? Do you think this is all some conspiracy nonsense? Well, it isn't. Indeed, not since Henry Bernays, quote, scientific marketing approach, based on Uncle Freud's work, have you really been safe from what he called, quote, the engineering of consent, end quote. In fact, this is what Bernays had to say in his book, Propaganda. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses as is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute the invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of, 
in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires that control the public mind. Well, today this scientific marketing is called neuromarketing, and instead of using things like galvanic skin response and blood pressure, we actually peer into the brain using very sophisticated technologies such as enhanced magnetic resonance imaging, positon emission tomography, and more. And this peering is done by those who would seek wealth and power, and that includes the very political structure of America. Now, my guest today is a prolific author, researcher, and one of the tallest voices in the small group of those warning us of the brainwashing methods and technologies that can and perhaps have already been used on some. I cited his work several times in my newest book, Mind Programming. For that matter, both of us appear together with Noam Chomsky, Dennis Kucinich, uh, Amy Goodman, and many others in the new documentary, Programming the Nation. Now, again, my guest today is probably best known for his work and published materials surrounding HARP. That's spelled H-A-A-R-P. However, he is equally well-versed on a variety of matters having to do with mind manipulation, brain entrainment, cell vibration, and much more, so don't just think of him as a physical scientist. Dr. Nick Begich is labeled HARP, H-A-A-R-P, as the new ground-based, quote, Star Wars, end quote, weapon. His book, Angels Don't Play This Harp, points out that harp is capable of brain entrainment as well as raining electromagnetic radiation down on Earth while punching at the ionosphere. But then I want him to share all of this with you personally. We have a lot to talk about, and we invite you to join us, and we will be discussing his other book, Controlling the Human Mind, the Technologies of Political Control, or of tools for peak performance. You can also join us by calling toll-free 1-866-254-1579. We want your calls. And international callers can dial the country code then 760-918-4300. All right, let's welcome today's guest. Uh, welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. Nick Begich. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you again, and uh, I know we're going to have a great, um, a great program. We've got a lot of material to cover today, so I'm excited uh, to be on the air with you. Well, fantastic. Thank you. I'm thrilled that you're here. I, you and I could probably sit down for a couple of days and just chat about some of the things that we have both worked on. But let's start by familiarizing our audience again uh, by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in, in harp and mind control, et cetera. Well, I, I have a, um, a, a doctorate in traditional and complementary medicines, and I, I come from a very political family in, in my part of the world, and I, I, a lot of interest in science over my lifetime. In the last 15 years, I've spent uh, writing and uh, publishing, lecturing um, on technologies. In fact, I've lectured in, uh, in 19 countries all over the United States, um, I think I've been a guest. We figured it out one day that it was somewhere over 2,500 programs in 15 years that we've done um, through both single stations and syndicated networks. And technologies, I think that's the, that's the real uh, emphasis of the work and translating complicated technologies into plain language is, is really what we're about. And, and I think that's an important role in this century. Um, all of us have computers. All of us, uh, uh, many of us have cars. And, and complicated equipment. Most of us can't fix it, can't repair it, but we certainly can operate it. And I think we need to look at technologies in the same way that conceptually in a democratic uh, society, a, a democratic republic such as ours, we need to know enough so conceptually we can have those conversations with policymakers and make sure that technologies serve our interests uh, rather than work against our interests. And I think that's, that's been sort of the hallmark of our work. Uh, people recognize us for the footnoting that we do, and all of our published materials are extensively footnoted, lots of additional um, bridges to cross uh, for people that are really interested in the subject matter, and we certainly provide the data so people can do that. Cool. Now, you, you, Nick, let's, uh, 
Uh, with that kind of a, an introduction, and, and you you said we several times, so give me a reference. What what is we? This is your website. My this website. Is your uh, the people that work on my my staff, and of course uh, listeners who really uh, provide us a tremendous amount of of input and feedback over the years. You know, we can't read everything, so people see articles and see materials. They clip it, send it on to us, and we integrate that into our work. And there's a there's a few out there that have just been fantastic in uh, providing that kind of material, and it just saves us a lot of time, and um, and they become part of the effort. And, and I think that's a, a really neat thing about radio is we're able to sort of tap the minds of a lot of other folks, and, and I always like to recognize the fact that, that we don't do this work alone. All right. So now that's a petition to our listening audience to participate. And how would they do that? Where would they go, Nick? What, give your website. Sure. The website is Earth Pulse, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E, earthpulse.com. And we have, uh, there's, there's links there that you can look at. There's lots of free articles, and there's even some uh, video material, audio material that's free on the site. But you can communicate with us through that site. Um, my assistant, Michelle, always uh, screens those out and makes sure that I get that material. Um, and, and, and it is uh, it is read, it is looked at, and, and we would just very much appreciate people's participation that way. If you see articles that are of interest to you that you think other people need to see, take them and pass them on. You know, get them to policymakers, get them to those people that are within your sphere of influence, and you too end up having an impact on uh, the things that we're trying, trying to do in, in opening public debate on many of these issues. Okay, now by way of background, because you are kind of a political activist, we have to introduce that. Your brother was just elected from the state of Alaska uh, to the House of uh, uh, Representatives. Your father, indeed, uh, well, I'll let you you tell us. Actually, it's it's the other way around. Dad was in the U.S. House, and Mark just got elected to the U.S. Senate. Oh, okay. Uh, and my mom good. was um, twice a, a committee woman uh, from Alaska. She was also a candidate for public office here Um all of us in the family have been involved one way or the other in, in Alaskan politics. Uh, I've run a couple of times for local office, and then I was involved heavily in educational issues here when I was president of the Alaska Federation of Teachers and also the Anchorage uh, Council of Education. So I, I think public education, at least for me, has been a major emphasis in my background. Both of my parents started out as educators, not lawyers, unlike a lot of politicians. And so, you know, education uh, and, and this component of it, uh, radio and writing, uh, has really been uh, a big emphasis, at least in, in my life, uh, in, in getting issues in front of the public. All right. Now we have a little bit of a feel about Nick Beggage. You and Gene Manning wrote a book, Angels Don't Play This Harp. Why don't they play this harp? What are you talking about? <laughs> this was the uh, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, and it, it is uh, a project that's ongoing in Alaska, uh, currently, the total expenditures uh, to date on that project are in excess of $250 million. Um, that was supposedly a small uh, dem- uh, developmental prototype uh, being put together initially by the Air Force um, and, and the Navy. It eventually flowed out of their hands and into DARPA's hands, which does predominantly the classified uh, defense research for uh, many of the uh, departments within the Department of Defense. Uh, the thing that uh, I think struck me is, is HARP is a huge array of uh, radio frequency transmitters that are designed uh, to do a number of things, um, but basically uh, it, it's, a, it's a very different way of handling radio frequency energy. It actually focuses the energy, and then by manipulating the ionosphere layer that begins about 30 miles above the Earth's surface, you can create a number of weapons effects. You can also... Uh, utilize this uh, transmitter for um, uh, coupling with the magnetic field lines that surround the Earth for other uses of the device. But basically, it is a um, a, a defense system and an offensive weapon system uh, in the developmental stage. It also is a research instrument uh, in the sense that you can stimulate effects in the ionosphere and then look at what happens on the ground. And the reason all that's important is uh, terrestrial communications are dependent on the character uh, of the ionosphere, which can be disturbed by solar radiation. And the idea initially was maybe we can figure out a way to stabilize the ionosphere during these unstable uh, periods where we could still effectively use our uh, communications or conversely disrupt the ionosphere in a specific way to to, uh, disrupt 
uh, adversarial communications in the event of war. So it kind of started as, you know, this really far out sort of project that got a little bit of funding. And as time has gone on, um, the technologies have been proven up. In fact, the things that Gene and I wrote about in 1995 in the first edition of um, Angels Don't Play This Harp have all pretty much over time proven themselves. There's two areas that still are uh, not fully acknowledged by the government, one dealing with weather modification and the other uh, dealing with the subject of the day, uh, the idea that these um, transmitters could be used to manipulate uh, human behavior. And this is, this is probably the most important um, aspect from our perspective of the technology. Well, let's take that on. Uh, first of all, uh, you, since you mentioned it, weather modification, they, the government has not faced that, but we know that China recently did exactly that, and they did it with very similar uh, technology to HARP. Right. Uh, is there any doubt in your mind about whether or not weather mo- uh, modification is possible as a result of HARP? Uh, no doubt at all. In fact, uh, Dr. Eastland, the inventor, just before he passed away, uh, he attended a conference. It was a closed conference uh, at the time I was working with the Lay Institute on Technology, and we had sponsored a number of scientists, including Dr. Eastland, to come in and talk to us. Uh, about um, this particular area, and what he had done is, in, in a couple years before, he had just finished a paper for University of Pennsylvania, where he indicated that you could, in fact, manipulate gravitational waves, a uh, direct connection to manipulating weather patterns, with 1,600 times less energy than he originally thought was necessary, uh, which means that the HARP system, as it's currently configured, could, in fact, have significant impacts on weather, either as a side effect of the operation of the device in certain modes or a deliberate effect. And it has always been part of the original planning documents on the facility. Uh, what has changed is not the, not the facility, but the knowledge of how these mechanisms, these underlying mechanisms for weather modification can work. The U.S. government has been involved in this for many, many uh, decades. In fact, in the mid-70s, we signed with 60 other countries an agreement not to use geophysical manipulation uh, as a weapon of war. And even Secretary of Defense William Cohen was lecturing at the University of Georgia when he was still Secretary of Defense back in 1997. And this is, of course, before uh, the 9-11 incident. And I'm looking very quickly for a quote that sort of sums it up. And he was talking about uh, terrorist states having the capability uh, in this area and, you know, when you think about terrorist states, we certainly don't think of sophisticated science. And what he said, and I quote, is, others are engaging even in an ecotype of terrorism whereby they can alter climate, set off earthquakes and volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves, unquote. Now, that's from the Secretary of Defense talking about pretty much unsophisticated uh, uh, states or even non-states, acts. terrorists. And so... Yeah. When we, look we have to at... take a break, Nick. Okay. When we get back, we'll be discussing more, um, particularly about the human uh, brain and human manipulation. And you're listening to Provocative Enlightenment. I've been talking with Dr. Nick Begich about mind control technologies. Nick has more than one book out there, and you can't go wrong by reading any of them. Go to my website, eldentaylor.com. Click on today's show and follow the links to his books, his website, and all of his other work. We'll be right back after we pay some bills. Confusion. Deception. Manipulation. Feeling a bit controlled. Lost. Learn how you can take back control of your life through proven techniques in Eldon Taylor's revised edition, of choices and illusions. This New York Times bestseller is a guidebook to your journey to self-actualization filled with practical, real-life solutions backed by scientific studies and guaranteed to awaken your inner genie. Get your copy today from all bookstores. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Eldon Taylor and it's my pleasure to host this special investigation. I love your comments and feedback, so please join me on Facebook or send your email to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com. That's E-L-D-O-N at EldonTaylor.com. We'll try to share some of your letters every week because your feedback does influence our programming, and we're grateful for that guidance. So I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, and enjoy. Close your eyes. Imagine your goals and dreams. What's preventing you from accomplishing them? 
Most often, we are our own worst enemies. I can't. I'm not good enough. It's time to reprogram that inner dialogue. Replace all those negative self images with I'm good. I am powerful. I can do anything. Eldon Taylor's Inner Talk patented subliminal technology does just that. Researched at numerous universities such as Stanford and by governments such as Mexico and Germany, Inner Talk has repeatedly been proven effective at changing your self talk. Stop imagining your goals and make them a reality today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I N N E R T A L K.com. Innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. All right. Now, if you just joined me, I'm Eldon Taylor, and my guest is Dr. Nick Begich. We're discussing brainwashing tools and other mind programming technologies. And before we went to the break, we were talking about two aspects or facets of HARP that uh, – the government is not yet fessed up to. One was the weather modulation, and and uh, Dr. Begich, myself, both totally agree that whether they come clean on this or not, there's no doubt about whether or not they possess the ability. The other has to do with the manipulation of the human mind, and that's done through frequency following response. I, uh, Dr. Begich, I'll just have you explain how that works, if you will, please. Sure. You know, the frequency following response is essentially where an external signal, um, and this can be generated by the pulsation of light through the optic nerve, through uh, binaural or bioral beat, through um, uh, sound, um, or electromagnetic uh, field pulses. And this is where, we, when we get to HARP, what we're really talking about is being able to modulate a signal um, that the brain will lock onto and begin to mirror. So if you're looking at an EEG and you're looking at that predominant brain activity begins to be driven or pushed into a certain direction, so we begin to mirror that external signal. And what this does is causes changes in brain chemistry uh, and general behavior. It can change uh, and alter emotional states uh, very readily and quite easily. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, even television programming, uh, if you look at television programming at night, if you look behind you at the reflection on a, on a white wall of the flicker rate of a television screen, if that flicker rate is manipulated in a very specific way, it results in this brain entrainment or frequency following response where you become much more um, receptive uh, to the actual advertising message. So the message can be overt, just a normal a uh, sound overt message coming across, but because you're already relaxed and then you get this enhanced relaxation, it's, it's you're not watching the program, you are the program. Uh, and, right. and I think that's what a lot of folks don't realize is that this is taught um, it, 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 in advanced uh, coursework in psychology and in other fields. They teach this, this knowledge, it's understood, um, and then the knowledge is applied in, in various ways, especially when you look at big budget advertising, um, and yet there's no restriction. There's no uh, constraint on the ability of advertisers to use the frequency falling response. As it relates to HARP, we can go back to J.F. Gordon McDonald's work when he was at UCLA and was a science advisor to Lyndon Johnson, and he published uh, an article, actually it was a chapter in a book called Unless Peace Comes from 1969, in which he said that if we could ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere in just the right way, we could return a signal to the Earth that would influence the behavior of most people um, uh, in, in, in the region of that signal. That same sentiment was echoed in a, in a later book by Zbigniew Brzezinski in the early uh, 70s when he was still at Columbia University before he became National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter, and he echoed uh, that same response. And what he was talking about was this idea that if we could ever figure that out. Well, we have figured that out. HARP delivers on that promise. It can create exactly that signal by sending a pulsed high-frequency signal up into the ionosphere. The ionosphere responds to the pulse rate. like the. You can think of it as, a, as if the signal were punching the ionosphere, and with each punch, the ionosphere responds with a long wavelength, an ELF, that comes back to the Earth 
penetrates the earth and sea and happens to be the same range of predominant brainwave activity of human beings causing that entrainment uh, effect. So as it relates to HARP, it would be sort of a gross effect uh, to affect emotional behaviors over very large uh, geographic areas. Yeah, and two things I think that are important to point out there, and you correct me if I've got this wrong, uh, Nick, but the first one is you're not going to be aware of this uh, frequency, this ELF frequency. That's correct. Uh, the second one is when when it entrains, like that television set, it's basically going to slow brainwave states, which for all intent and purposes end up modulating uh, part of the endocrine system. The result is uh, it 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 can definitely be used to influence mood states. Absolutely, and, and, and that's the intent. I mean, the intent is, you're, it's almost, um, you know, if you think about where people are when they come back from a hard day at work, they sit in front of the TV, they immediately begin to relax, the breathing becomes rhythmic, the brain begins to slow, and then you add this on, and it's just a slight kick to almost, and in some people perhaps, even a, a light hypnotic state where you talk to them and you're hollering at them, they don't even hear you. They're not even in the room with you. Uh, and yeah. it, it's that state that they're trying to reach so that they can then literally deliver the message at a, at a very powerful level. Right. Indeed, I think it's worth mentioning here, and, and perhaps you already know this, but uh, we've, there, none of, we have run a number of studies where we've actually tried to bribe young people as well as adults to stay in a normal state of consciousness, what we think of as the beta uh, brainwave pattern above 14 cycles per second. In less than five minutes, adults and children alike will go into alpha in front of a television despite the fact that you promise them rewards if they just stay in that normal state. And in that alpha, you know, that's a state we we think of. It's associated with hypnosis. I've testified in the courts, as you know, as an expert witness on that. Uh, and we just call it a state of hypersuggestibility. So here you are. You're sitting in front of your television set. You've gone into this state of hypersuggestibility. And now they start talking to you about, you know, products or gombu or, or whatever. Uh, and what you're saying, if I've got this right, Dr. Begich, is... HARP makes it possible to do that outside of your living room, maybe even affect you in the pasture where you have your horse if you live in the country. Exactly right. And, and, and the, you know, it affects a large uh, number, a number of people. And, you know, the, the military has said, well, it's a side effect. We're not really interested in it. Well, as a side effect, there's a lot of side effects that we get real interested in it. That's why they warn you when you get prescription drugs about all those things. Uh, this is... Uh, a very big deal uh, from our perspective. And when you when you look at this, the way the system has evolved, um, you know, DARPA is not known for uh, benign projects, and they don't just fund, <laughs> uh, you know, they don't fund research for the fun of it. They, they fund research for weapons applications. Dr. Eastland talked to the head of DARPA, and t I forget Tony's last name, but they were, they were good friends. And he raised the issue of mind control as bluntly as that, um, and nobody's laughing at DARPA these days. In fact, uh, even the most recent Navy protocols on uh, human experimentation that were uh, certified in uh, 2006 on, on page 9 of that, and we have it on our website, you, you can see that mind control experiments using those words within the Navy protocol require the Assistant Secretary of the Navy to approve them because of the potential public outcries the projects go on. In fact, RFPs have just been closed up in September of this year, um, inviting proposals in this area uh, to enhance the ability of doing these things. Now, there, it, for two different purposes. One is to degrade um, the performance of your adversary, and the other is to enhance uh, the performance of your own troops. In fact, um, Technology Horizons, which is produced by the Air Force uh, Research Labs in their June 2004 issue, they actually talk about controlled effects, being able to um, synthesize or, or create um, uh, any of the five senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, in such a way in, in the direction that they're headed is to create a method of control because ultimately command and control of the battlefield has to do with your adversary. If you can control the operator, then all their hardware and all their equipment is worthless to them uh, if you can manipulate the behavior of those actually running that equipment. And the idea of creating 
um, experiences that are so real you can't distinguish the, uh, the real from the synthetic is a direction that the Air Force openly in their own open literature uh, talk about in a direction that a, a great deal of research money is being spent uh, currently in these directions by several branches of the military as, as well as the intelligence organizations. Yeah, and of course, some of the scary part of that is uh, if history is to be a guide, and it usually is, uh, some of these clandestine operations often experiment on innocent uh, civilians, and sometimes the adversary isn't always what we think of a foreign country. Let's, uh, we've got questions coming out of the chat room and uh, callers online, so let's, let's take a phone call here. We've got Mara calling from London, England. Uh, Mara, you're on the line Hi. with Dr. Nick Baggage. How are you today? Hi, I'm very good, thank you. I was actually just listening to you guys, and, um, and I, I was wondering, because I don't understand, you know, the science that much, but I'm just wondering if actually, um, you know, if, you know, we're talking about mind control, but, um, but I was just thinking in terms of, of relationships, you know, like if, you know, I'm going to ask the question, right? Sure. And, you know, shoot it out. Because the issue, the issue became um, became to my mind because I actually have this relationship, uh, broken relationship that I'm trying to heal with this person, uh, just just basically becoming friends, and I and I haven't been able to do that, and I was just trying to, in terms of, um, you know, not mind control, but you know, um, putting the other person in kind of suggestive state for them to be receptive. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a fair question to ask, and you know the, the the thing about all of that is 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 now you're getting into the interference of another person's free will, and and my personal view of that is 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 that's off limits. I mean, if you you can you can convince someone by the logic of argument, you can convince people by the emotion of argument often as well, but to to literally. Uh, dive into someone's psyche in this way without their consent or knowledge uh, fundamentally violates at least my sense of, of what is uh, as ethically appropriate. And it's one of the problems uh, with this. You know, I had one guy in a lecture ask me once, well, wouldn't it be great to just make everyone happy? And, and the answer to that is absolutely not. And the reason in, in my mind is because you know those, those traumatic experiences and the experiences that perhaps you're going through now are the very ones that we need to evolve as human beings. It's through the trials of life that the, the gold is refined. It's not in the, in, in the smooth, easy times more often than not. It's in the, in the times of difficulty or hardship. And, you know, whatever things have happened in that relationship, um, perhaps they allow us to, to grow from that and to move forward in a way that um, helps us all evolve. And, and the friendship that comes from the, the respect of each other, I think, is, is more important perhaps in the immediate satisfaction of a, of a maintained relationship. You know, no, I'll I add agree to that. You, but then from, from, sorry, just from an experimental point of view, I mean, we, we, you know, it's not about really about delving, but aren't we actually affecting each other anyhow in terms of, in the way we, you know, are, aren't we doing that already? You know, I think whole... on a subtle, subtle level that's correct. And, and, and for two people, yeah. particularly um, in sync or in love, if you gaze in each other's eyes and you hold the gaze uh, and you monitor the EEG patterns of both people, very often, in fact, more often than not, the patterns will sync up. Uh, you'll you'll see a, a, a synchronicity, you know, or a, a synchronization rather of of the brain activity of both people because they're in resonance or in harmony with one another. Um, that is a normal sort of thing. At the same time, I think at a very subtle level, on maybe even an unconscious level, there's an exchange of energy that takes place between two people um, mm -hmm. that harmonizes their essential field. People who are married for a long time, um, initially when, you're, when, you're, when your relationship is beginning, there might be some polarity and there might be a lot of differentials in that energy potential, but as you get to know each other and you stay with each other, they tend to equalize. Uh, and then also things change, like sex drive drops because of that equalization as well. Um, and that happens just as a natural consequence of association with someone for, for a long period of time. Okay. I might add to that. that great. A, I might add to yeah. that, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, my office receives a lot of inquiries about it, precisely what is uh, presupposed in your question. Is there a technology that you can use that will influence another person? And Dr. Beggage is absolutely right. In, in my opinion, I... Uh, that's that's an area that you don't want to go. But does that technology exist? 
The answer is yes. Are there people that, that use those kinds of technologies? The answer is also yes. Uh, so having that awareness, however, and then coming back to what Nick has just advised you, um, I, I do believe that, um, you know, the best path for each of us to go is the path that avoids attempting to manipulate another human being. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, no, I, I get that. I, I, I didn't really see it as manipulation as much as, you know, pe- we, 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 we all are connecting and exchanging at a, at a subconscious level. And um, I was actually more um, thinking how, you know, if if it's done through love, is that manipulation? It, it just basically just just pacifying the, 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 well, whatever the you know if it's done rather than, if it's done through love, I, it's done unconditionally, right? Because, I mean right. that is love. I, I'm going to do this unconditionally, yeah. and so if what you yeah. do is you turn it over to this or something better, you know then you're doing this unconditionally. Whatever your feelings, you, whatever you're expressing or giving, you're giving it unattached. And in that unattached, sure. you have no quid pro quo in mind. Right. You don't expect yeah. you're going to get something back. Now, if you do yeah. that, I, I have no objection to that. I, I don't know about you, Dr. Beggies. No, but... I think that's a very good thing. And I think that, that any time you're working from that center, uh, only good can come of it. And, and as you say, your expectations aren't that anything will come back. Um, and when it does, it's always a pleasant surprise. And if it doesn't, you've at least contributed something good to the process and, and not taken away from anyone. Okay. Thanks for the question. All right. That was a great question. Thank, Thank you, you for your call, Mara. We have a question in the chat room I want to go to here before we move to the next subject quickly, uh, Nick. It's, uh, Jack asked this. There is a question of why the pineal gland calcifies in adults. There is a strong link to fluorides. Does the doctor feel that the pineal is tied in with consciousness and could heart possibly be involved to continue, like the calcium, suppress human consciousness? Well, that's interesting, and you know, and, and that's um, an interesting uh, thought about what causes that to happen. Um, you know, I think it is important for consciousness. In fact, a good friend of mine uh, in in Finland actually did a study and found that people who had a very uh, strong differential um, in in that portion of the brain with the, with the uh, in the frontal lobe, uh, they they actually have this sort of energy differential between the back of the head and the front of the head. And the bigger that energy differential, the more um, extrasensory perceptions were registered in those individuals. And it's it's interesting because when you look at the development of the glands uh, in young people, when they reach their peak, there was work in the Soviet Union um, that Ostrander and Schroeder cited that young people at a specific uh, age, you know, under, say, 15, 13, 12, in that range, uh, demonstrated a, a heightened um, extrasensory perceptions for things like eyeless sight when when those glands were were the most uh, developed and um, you know and I, I think all of that is in, important is heart responsible for um, hampering or could it be responsible for hampering um, brain function and the answer is yes it could in fact Persing, Persinger at Laurentian University at one point suggested that if we could ever figure this out that we could create a complex signal that could be broadcast over large areas that would make people sort of agitated. And then you run a news broadcast where you blame some ethnic group or terrorists or something for all of your ills, and mm-hmm. a lot of that anger then gets turned in that direction. It's a very simple thing um, that you could do uh, with HARP. But inhibiting people's ability to reach higher states of consciousness uh, underlying all of the sort of controlling people aspects of the mind control work of the government's around the world, I think ultimately it gets down to that, is what did they really find out? Um, Not just about how to manipulate behaviors, but the fact of how to unleash potentials. And those potentials are a little bit scary from a governmental perspective. I mean, can you imagine um, a population that had the ability of of exercising telepathy at will? Uh, What secrets could you hide uh, from that? Uh, Could you imagine a fully actualized personality demonstrating all of those anomalous potentials that human beings have and that are periodically demonstrated? Uh, That is an uncontrollable situation from a government perspective. And I think, you know, if if you want to talk about sort of the sinister side of things, you know, that's it. It's to to hamper or 
um, uh, restrain uh, human consciousness. And the, and the greatest weapon of all is fear and worry, because we can't reach our higher states of consciousness as long as we're in a state of fear and worry. And I think that's sort of the state that we're kept in by either the propaganda we're fed, uh, the advertising mediums, I mean, all the things that come at us every day, and trying to overcome that and gaining a greater control of our own mental capacities, and then trying to discover um, what those inner inner possibilities are, really, I think, is the path of life. I think that's what we're on this planet to do, uh, to learn more about ourselves and then be able to express uh, that potential. Um, I, I kind of subscribe, and I do subscribe to the idea that we're created in the image of a creator, which means that we get to co-create. Uh, when we hamper the ability of the mind to reach those states of consciousness, then in fact we deny our birthright. And I, I don't think that's appropriate. I think we have great opportunities. There's many paths to the finish line, um, but we need to pursue um, the awakening of consciousness, not its uh, suppression or manipulation by others. Amen, amen, amen. I like that sermon. Now the next question, Nick, <laughs> and I totally, totally concur with you uh leads us where i'd like to go for at least you know the next couple of minutes as we wrap up this show out of the chat room we're being asked could harp be used for positive purposes well when when you answer that there is a whole host of materials including the persinger helmet i mean uh, the electromagnetic helmet you mentioned persinger uh that can uh elicit responses in the human being that uh, awaken us uh, a step at a time. Treat that, if you will. Uh, you've got less than two minutes, Nick. Okay. In, in terms of um, HARP, I don't think so, because it's not something that you then personally get to control or determine when it's on and when it's off and what it's doing. On the personal level, I think this is very important because there's lots of technologies out there. In fact, in the last um, quarter of the book, Controlling the Human Mind, we dedicated really to exploring some of those tools Tools like light and sound devices, electrocranial stimulation, um, biofeedback technologies, things that allow us to learn and enhance our own capacities as human beings. And those are the exciting things because those become individually driven. Uh, Light and sound devices, uh, one that, that we carry on the website, you can actually jack in audio information. So you can record your own affirmations in your own voice and literally plug it in uh, to your mind at a super suggestive uh, state of consciousness to help you improve those things that you personally want to improve without the influence of others sort of driving the truck for you. You get to be the driver. um, You get to be the person that decides the perimeters. uh, And there's great tools out there for doing this. And I encourage people to look at those technologies. And I know uh, I know you, Eldon, deal with a lot of this, too, in your work, and there are some great things out there that are, that are really exciting uh, for stimulating the mind and, and opening up those pathways to perhaps higher consciousness, and, and we get to control them individually, and that, I think, is a very exciting uh, direction of this technology. Well, I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, and I know you share this, that's the reason both of us do the work that we do do. That's the reason you've written uh, Controlling the Human Mind, your contributions to HARP, your lectures, etc. That's the reason I do my work. Uh, you know, it isn't to alarm people. It's actually to encourage them to become aware, uh, to take responsibility, and to use some of these tools. And we're out of time. Hey, it was uh, a pleasure. My pleasure to be with you. You're going to have to come back and listen. I, I, all of you out there listening, if you, uh, uh, if you have been listening, you'll want to get a hold of Dr. Begich's work. You can go to my website, ellentaylor.com, click through to his books at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, click through to his website. Uh, you can go to his website, Earth Pulse. Give it again, Nick, would you please? Earthpulse.com, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E.com, earthpulse.com. Uh, all right. Now, Uh, That's the end of our hour. I want to thank our guest today for joining us, and I hope you've enjoyed our show, and we'll listen again next week.